This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're eight games into the season, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here again to talk Flames hockey. Matt, how you doing? Well, it wasn't a very good week for Flames fans, but not much you can do about that. Well, let's talk about those two games. The Flames started the week out with a game against the Carolina Hurricanes, a game that I think we weren't really sure what to expect in this one. And the Hurricanes ended up surprisingly... Uh, walking away with the with the big win in this game. Overall thoughts on the Hurricanes game? The Flames made it too easy on the Hurricanes defense and Scott Darling. I don't think that for the first 50-ish minutes of the game, the Flames simply didn't play. And uh, they did score the late goal and... If they would have played... At that point, it was too little too late. Yeah, if they would have played with any passion or zest in the first 50 minutes of the game, then they probably would have won that game. But like last year, it's the same story where everybody's a little off and nobody's on the right page, it seems. And it's the, the exact same story from a year ago. The thing I thought was interesting about this game, if you look at the penalties, there was four penalties taken by the Flames against former Flame Josh Juris. Travis Hamannick tripped him. Uh, Kachuk had a holding penalty against him. Bennett hooked him, and Kachuk w- had a roughing penalty. So Juris was a thorn in our side all night. That's not a name I ever thought I'd be talking about Oh, again. good for him to be getting another opportunity in the NHL, and he's taking advantage of it for sure. You know, when we talked in the off season, I was a big fan of uh, Scott Darling and bringing Darling in here as the Flames' starting goalie. Um, you know, after seeing this game, I think that he looked pretty good, but you're right. He didn't see a lot of traffic, and I think that was the Flames' problem. Is I think Darling's a guy that if you put a lot of pucks on him, you're going to get some through, and the Flames just had... I don't know what their problem was. Maybe it was just too many days off, but they just seemed really flat. Well, with... The Flames, that they seem to have had a difficult time when the opposition has high-quality defense. And they just can't seem to get anything in their own game going whatsoever. And we saw that even in the Minnesota game where they were trying, but they just couldn't get any high-quality chances in on Staylock. And it's... They have to learn how to play against teams that have good defense because you just simply can't be shut down. Like we saw against Edmonton and uh, the other game where they got shut out. And it, like it just giving too much respect to the opposition almost. And it just... The, the whole team just seems a little off in terms of knowing what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. And, like, you would think that after the disastrous start to the season a year ago that they would be more ready to go from day one than they have been. But, like, certain players certainly are. Like, Monaghan and Goudreau are doing a great job, but, like, pretty much everybody else is still like, oh, I'm supposed to be here doing this instead of that. And it's just frustrating to see so i mean this team has had the mo for years of being a slow starter the flames you know as long as i can remember it's always been oh well excuse it it's a slow start and you know i mean you're right we've got guys who don't seem like they know what they're doing or haven't got started yet but that's what the preseason's for i mean when the puck drops at the beginning of the regular season you're supposed yeah, to be and like ready. A, it's not like i'm so s- as, a, as a coach or a gm what do you do to get this team well, it's ready? also not like i'm wanting the team to be peaking in October like give me a break the important games are like from February on it's just you can't be this disorganized 
every year, and it's been since basically the year 2000 that this team has just been a complete mess at the start of each season, other than the one year where Roman Turek got his contract because he was doing so well. And it's just, it's hard to put a finger on exactly what is wrong because like it's not like the offensive system is different or the defensive system is different uh, so like there shouldn't be this complete uncoordinated lack of effort in certain aspects movement from this team and to answer your question after that uh how you fix that is I honestly don't have a clue on how you f fix it in terms of uh, other than continually changing out personnel until they get it through their head that you have to actually show up in October. Beyond that, I don't know. Like, at least the goaltending has been good this year, but it's... Like, it, it, honestly, if it wasn't for Mike Smith playing as well as he has, the Flames could be 1-7 and seven right now. Well, and, you know, you talked about moving personnel, and if you look at the roster, there hasn't actually been that much change in personnel since this time last no. year. I mean, Goudreau, Monaghan, Furland, Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich, they were all here. Bennett was here. Stajan was here. Versteeg was here. Brower was here. So the only forwards right now that weren't was Lazar and Yager. On the back end, um, the only probably n really new guy is uh, Stone and Hamannick. So that's what, four of our 18 plus the goalies. So I think last year we, we chalked it up to, you know, oh, Monaghan and Goudreau didn't have a training camp, but we're running out of excuses. Yeah, and like Sam Bennett still doesn't have a point. And I'm not harping on him specifically, but it, like it, it's everybody. And it's just frustrating to see because if you had more than just Monaghan and Goudreau playing well, the Flames would probably be 7-1. and one. Like, they're just not getting good bounces going their way, and they're not getting any offense outside of Goudreau and Monaghan, by and large. It's just... If this team ever does get everybody on the same page, or mostly everybody on the same page... They're going to absolutely destroy the opposition. It's just, you know, it's a lot easier said than done. Well, we're only eight games in. We have 73 more games to try and get everything in sync. And I'm pretty confident that by this time next month, we're going to see the Flames running on all cylinders. Oh, for sure. It's just that the lack of effort and intensity. Some players seem to be getting down on themselves a bit. It, and frustrated with themselves and hopefully that like it seems like almost like the whole team needs some bounces just to go their way some really dumb goals that just bounce in off of players or you know what i mean like just garbage goals just to like snap out of this malaise where it, it seems like just everybody outside of Gaudreau and monahan are just frustrated and they just but I don't even think it's just bad bounces. I mean, if I look at the at the game against the Wild, I thought the Flames could have won that one in the first period. They could have easily been up two or three goals, but they had no finish. They were getting a lot of pucks in front of the net, but they never got the shots off. They never had the, you know, the finish they needed in that period. And that's all I think. Really, just a mental thing. You got to know where you got to be. I mean, I've talked about this for years in the show. The Flames often don't have a man in front of the net, and good things aren't going to happen if you're not putting the puck on net mm -hmm. properly. Oh, I agree, and like that is one of the beneficial things of the Yager signing is that it, you can just park him in front of the net, and on the, especially on the power play, and he'll do his thing. But it's just the whole team just seems like they need a to get out of their own way, and it seems like based on how they're playing, they're making a lot of really basic mistakes that like shouldn't really happen at the NHL level with the especially with the frequency that they've been happening and you know that the there's two things here that I think really need to happen first off the coach keeps 
threatening to take away ice time, but isn't. And that's a, you know, a thin threat. And I think maybe that's what needs to start happening is saying, all right, we're going to sit somebody and bring up somebody from Stockton or put Freddie Hamilton or Tanner Glass in the lineup and just start sitting those guys that are making mistakes. We've seen that in the past. Hartley did that the first year he was here. It was you had to play well or you're out of lineup. And that seemed to kickstart that team. The other thing I yeah. think that maybe they need to do, shuffle up the lines, even taking a line like our 3M line and saying, you know what, we're going to take it apart for a couple of games and move everybody around with new partners might get guys out of sort of their complacency that they have with their, their line mates. I agree. And other than Gaudreau and Monaghan, because they are clicking, and at least you have one pairing that's doing something, uh, I especially with Yager being out, I wouldn't mind switching everything up even just basically throwing everything in a blender and seeing if anything sticks yeah i mean try somebody new do something crazy like try lazar at the first line on right wing yeah or even kachuk who knows like you could throw any combination of anything and hoping that there will be a longer term fit it's just even if it's just for a few minutes, it, like to start the game before resetting back to the usual partners, just getting off of the same page that you've been on, sometimes just something different might help to shake things up and move things around a bit so that way you're not repeating the same mistakes. Yeah, and you might find something out about a certain player. Either they have chemistry or they can play a different game than you thought. But I think right now, before we're too deep into the season, might be a good time to do that. And looking at the schedule the Flames have coming up, I mean, they've got two back-to-backs this week, Dallas and Washington. I honestly think a game like Washington against an Eastern Conference opponent might be a good time to do that. Yeah, and hopefully they can keep Ovechkin off the scoring sheet for a change. Yeah, I mean, that probably wouldn't be the biggest issue in that game, but for sure. <laughs> so, I, you know, and that might be the way to shake it up and say, okay, you guys aren't playing well with your line, so let's just throw them all out, like you said, and start again. Yeah, and it never hurts to try new things. And worst case scenario is that a certain line doesn't work, and then you find a different combination and just shake things up because it... it it would be one thing if two of the lines were going properly and the other two are struggling, but it's basically just Gaudreau and Monaghan being awesome and everybody else having a very hard time with things. Yeah, and I think that, like you said, if there's two lines doing their thing, that's great. But right now with three lines, really, three lines in one position, I don't even think that we have a right winger on the first line we can say he's working well. Just try new things. I'm not saying break him up forever. And if you need to, like you said, go back after the first period. Say, okay, it didn't work back to where we usually are. But it might be a way to jolt some guys around and try something different. Yeah, and even if it's just, uh, like, say, Bennett... uh moving him off of the third line might be enough to like if he does get the opportunity to be back on the third line maybe might be trying a little bit harder to not get sent back down to the fourth line see i know they tried it last year but if i was the coach i'd drive Versteeg again up with monahan and goudreau yeah and i wouldn't be shocked if that happened at some point with yager being out so you know just try something different yeah. Well, Matt, I got a breakdown here. Um, everyone at the beginning of this year was talking about how much different the Flames were this year from last year. And if you look at the stats, and we'll go through them here, there's one stat for sure that's actually looking a lot better for the Flames in 2017, 2018 after eight games. But really, I mean, there's not a whole lot of difference between the first eight this year and the first eight last year. Yeah. Well, they their record last year was 3-4-1 and one after eight games. This year it's 4-4. Four and four. Uh, scored 24 goals last year 20 this year gave up 29 last year 23 this year the shots for are almost identical they've given up about 40 more shots against and the save percentage has gone up from 879 to 919 to me that stat right there is the big stat that's important 
Yeah, and if it wasn't for that, like if the Flames were getting an 879 save percentage right now, uh, the Flames would be 1 and 7. They'd be like the Oilers. Yeah, basically. So and it's And then who would we mock? <laughs> I was going to say Vegas, but even they're doing well. Yeah. I know, they've I won know. six of their first seven, and now they're without yeah. any NHL experience in that. So that'll be fun for them. And this is where I think you start to see them falling back into where they should be as an expansion team. Unless Oscar Donsk or uh, Maxime Legacy, I think that's... Yeah, that's the who they call us. Yeah, if, unless those guys turn into, like... 0506 Kiprasov or something like that then well if that happens Vegas is going to have to make a trade quick yeah but I mean in eight games they've already gone through four goalies yeah, they're dropping starting, like flies they're starting to look like what was that year the Flames went through ten goalies yeah that was the year we found Bradway Tyrone Gardner yeah and Tyler Moss and all sorts of guys they were dropping like flies yeah. so Maybe we can give them our Rolodex. Maybe they'll start bringing in, you know, Andre Trefloff again. Oh, yeah. What's Bob Essensa doing? <laughs> or Ken Reggett. Who's the goalie coach there? Suit him up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, looking at, the, looking at the team where we are now, it's not that different from last year. The Flames really got a lot of kudos last season, if you remember, because they did a lot of good things in the first 40 games. But even there, they start out a little bit rough. So I think if we look at that as an indication, I think there's still a lot of up to go. I don't see the team playing 500 yeah. hockey all season. We just have to get over this hump and figure out how to motivate these players and go from there. But, you know, if this team doesn't make the postseason, this is an epic failure. Oh, yeah. Well, also, like last year, uh, after the eight game mark, the like following eight games were all against like the NHL's best teams. So, like, the Flames ended up being 30th halfway through November. And while it's not quite as bad, the Flames are, like, the next five games are not going to be very fun with Nashville, St. Louis, Dallas, Washington, and the Pittsburgh Penguins. So, and if they don't sort th things out very quickly, this team could end up having a really poor September and or October I mean and start looking very much like the team from last year and where they're going to need a six or seven or eight game winning streak just to erase the horrible start yet again and this was the thing I was mostly worried about was with this team is are they going to get off to a horrible start again and frankly, our division is up for grabs this year because none of Anaheim, Edmonton, Los Angeles, or San Jose looks to be very good. So them getting off to a... Neither does Calgary. No. Uh, right now, no. But the Flames should be better than this. And if they're not putting up the results, then things are going to start going sideways where if they if they play well they would be more of a shoe in for the division title and right now if they especially over the next week and a bit if they continue to lose a lot of games like things you know we're going to be talking more of a wild card team again not a division champion which that's what this team should be and it's just frustrating because the team made changes to bolster things, and yet there's no real difference between a year ago and this year. And, like, last year we only realistically had three NHL defensemen for the first, like, five months of the season up until Stone was acquired. Dennis Wideman, this year we Giordano, and Brody, right? <laughs> Hardly, but yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, then, uh, like this year we have five legitimate NHL defensemen plus Bartkowski and Kulak filling in adequately. So like this stuff should not be happening and yet it is. And it's one of those 
things that like it, it'd be different if the flames had a bunch of prospects that you could just cycle through but all of them underperformed in training camp and other than Jankowski's line mates in Stockton, Andrew Majapane and Garnett Hathaway, all of Stockton's players have been somewhat terrible. And well, as you mentioned earlier, like it's not as though the first two lines are doing well and the last two aren't. Where you can even say, okay, let's take a guy, you know, like say Lazar, who's looking great, and put him on the first line. Besides Johnny and Monty, we've really got nobody who's doing anything. No, and, like, um, Michael Froelich has looked borderline terrible for most of the season, which sometimes he does fade into the background a bit, but, like, he hasn't been overly noticeable. Uh, Kachuk's been okay. Backlund's been a little worse than last year, and, like, his penalty that, uh, against, um... Carolina the other day uh that one helped to, to stymie the Flames comeback attempt it, you know it just there's just everybody's just a little off and it's not like the Flames have any internal options that they can just say oh Spencer Foo's doing great throw him in there it's basically the Jankowski show and that's it but even but even then I mean maybe it is maybe it is a matter of saying who's the best guy in Stockton and let's bring him up just to make an example yeah and that's what Jankowski with him getting recalled today uh, he's been one of the best players in the AHL so give him a shot and hopefully he sparks the team but if the players don't start getting their stuff together soon like the flames are gonna have to do something to shake things up and even if that may mean a trade or two to move things around yeah i think it's kind of early in the season to make a deal but i can see i mean we've got some guys that are, we could move up or down i could see doing something like uh waving a brower or a stage and just to just to shake things up to say the team nobody's yeah. safe although i wouldn't with either of those two players because I think they've been doing well but I other players sure why not um and you know it's only eight oh, games for I sure mean, we're we don't want to we don't want to pull the fire alarm yet I think by the end of the season when we're 12 games in that's really a good look at where this team's at one of the benefits I think the Flames have this year over last is if you look at the schedule this month and next, we got a lot of breaks. Like the Flames already had a four-day break. They've got a three-day break coming up. I think that really gives them a chance to sit down and try to work through some of the stuff where in the past we've seen they were playing like almost every other day and didn't practice for a good number of days. Yeah, true enough. And like I'm just expressing my own frustrations just because I don't want to see them – getting in their own way to the point where it screws their whole season just because they got off to a slow start again you don't want them and to get into a hole by christmas and then have to dig themselves out of it after christmas yeah because i don't want to be talking about oh who besides rasmus dolan is going to be the good pick this year you know what i mean like it, well, we don't even have a pick in the first oh, two yeah, rounds i forgot jeez yeah, well, that's not that would be a, extremely horrible then. <laughs> so, who who's projected to go between what sixty one and ninety that we might take? Yeah, like we don't want to start talking about that. So you know, but that's what I'm saying. It, it would be, be a disaster. Talk- like you know, this team is built. Oh, yeah. This team gave up assets to be a contender, and if they're not or they can't be, then I think there's questions that start being asked. Oh, for sure. And, like, this team should be one of the elite teams. And the fact that they're having the same problems, that's... Yeah. Did it be fair? Nobody goes 82-0. and 0. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, like, I'm not saying that, oh, they, the sky's falling because it's 4-4. Four and four. It's how they've looked while it's 4-4. Four and four. Like, frankly, if it, they didn't have mike smith playing as well as he has they could be one and seven right now and that that's where and that's what scares me i mean eddie lack's got to play at least 10 games this year and what are we going to get when he's in net that's the frustrating thing because like the flames have been beneficial to have the good goaltending that they've had and 
like they could be really screwed right now if it wasn't for Mike Smith. And it's just frustrating because they should be better than this. You know, and, and the way I look at it is I can't go back and think of a contender who hasn't had an eight-game slump. Oh, Everyone for goes sure. on a slump, and I'm kind of hoping we're just getting ours out of the way early. That's the way I'm hoping this ends up is, you know what, the Flames are on a bit of a slump. Even though they're winning, they're not looking good. Let's get over with, and then we can move on with, you know, playing some top-level hockey. Mm-hmm. And, like, when they do have the good stretches in games, like, they are just murdering the opposition. It's just there's no consistency. And that's the the lion's share of the problem is that you just don't know when that light switch is going to get turned on. One of the big criticisms from fans for the last couple years, and especially this year, is Glenn Gulletson and some of his choices around how he uses his roster especially on the forward side this year a couple of things i've noticed that i wanted to get your take on i thought it's really weird that tanner glass has been used i wouldn't say a lot but tanner glass has been used on the penalty kill and to me tanner glass is a defensive hazard he's not the kind of guy you want to put out on the pk and at the same time if you look on the flip side the first power play unit has been johnny goudreau sean monahan and troy brower with brody and versteeg and I'm, I'm wondering if they're just trying to get something out of Brower, but that's not the kind of guy I'm looking at to play first-line power play minutes. Do you think it's just trying to spark something? Do you think it's just, why not put him there? No one else is doing anything good. What do you think is going through Glenn Gullison's head well, here? Well, I can't critique the penalty kill too much because the Flames have the fourth-best penalty kill in the NHL. And w- Yeah, but if you keep playing a guy like that, it's going to go downhill real fast. No, not really. He's done a fairly proficient job when he is playing on the penalty kill. So, it, I don't know. Even a guy like Alan Vino, who loved Tanner Glass, didn't put Tanner Glass in the penalty kill. Yeah, well, to be fair, Glass has played rather well in each of the games he's played for Calgary. So, I can't harp on him too much. So, no, but I guess I'm just looking at other guys in the roster thinking, okay, if we got to kickstart somebody like uh, Lazar or something like that, why don't we give them those minutes to them and try to get them, you know, off and doing something good? True. It, I I know what you mean. It's just for now, it seems to be working. So don't change things up too much until things start going south, and then you can shake things up then. So what about the first power play unit of Goudreau, Monahan, Brower? Well, for when Yager started to play, Yager would play in that position that Brower was getting. So we'll see. Like I don't think that you'll see Brower on the power play this next week. At least I'm hoping not. Uh, yeah, like I can understand it because he's a big body and he does go in front of the net and has no problem and when he's been successful it that's where he got a lot of his points when he was with St. Louis and with Washington so like I can understand but to me why. you got to earn your way onto that lineup oh I know and Brower ha- frankly has been a lot better lately and he is getting a little bit more responsibilities yeah the points aren't going in yet but really other than Gaudreau and Monaghan are they for anybody so it must be like Halloween or something the team sucks Brower's doing good did you think we'd have this yeah, discussion I know like honestly I think Brower might be the third best flame at this point which uh, at least up front and it's like um have we gone into bizarro world here <laughs> the twilight zone yeah everybody else is doing mediocre and it's Troy Brower Johnny Goudreau and Sean Monaghan that are doing their jobs well it's just good for well, him Brower's got know, something to prove yeah well he's doing a good job and it the points will come for him like I'm not overly concerned with that it's just he needed to get doing the fundamentals correctly and that's where a lot of the rest of the team is having difficulties is that they're not doing the fundamentals correctly and the points aren't coming because of the fundamentals being off and where Brower, he's doing the fundamentals right, but the points aren't coming. So it's a catch-22, but... 
See, the thing with Brower, though, is, I mean, he's only doing those fundamentals about eight, nine minutes a night, and I think that's easier to do. I would question if he'd be able to do the same thing if he was playing, you know, on a higher line. And that's why he should eventually get a 15-minute game in and see where he's being used on in the top nine in an actual regular rotation to see if he can stretch that out where he is doing the right things for longer because if he is, then he will be an effective and good player for us instead of, you know, just being a fourth liner and all the, the negativity around him because, oh, he's getting paid too much. Well, if the Flames keep taking penalties like they have, being a you know a penalty killer, you could be playing a ton of minutes in the next week here. So maybe if they drop him down to the PK, he'll be playing a lot more minutes without necessarily putting him on a top two line. Well, and he has been playing very well on the PK, and that's one of the reasons why it's the fourth best in the league. So, you know, it, we'll see. Like everything, we'll see. And the team has a lot that they have to do to work on to get things going in a positive direction but a lot of teams can say the same thing like even uh, the coach for minnesota was saying that it's almost like their team's afraid of winning at times and so we'll see it, it's we always see the beginning everybody. of the season teams that are surprising on both sides i mean vegas is the team surprising this year and the flames are surprisingly maybe more disappointing than we thought but i find by the end of 82 it all evens itself out oh yeah for sure well, look at Anaheim and Calgary last year. Like they were two of the worst teams in the league to start the season, and then one won the division, and the other played them in the first round. So we'll see. I'm not overly concerned or anything. It's just it's just more frustration that like come on guys, get it together. Well, the Flames made a big roster move, so this might spur some change to the lineup. Uh, they put Yermer Yager on the IR, the injury reserve. According to Derek Wills, uh, Yermer Yager's lower body injury is a soft tissue injury, and the Flames expect him to miss about a week. So he just got here, and he's already broken. Matt, we've had him for less than 30 days. Do you think we can return him? Why would one want to? It's probably just a minor injury, like a, a groin pull or something like that, where... Like, if it was the playoffs, he'd probably still be playing, and he probably wouldn't have missed any a shift even, but because he's 45 and it's the first couple of weeks of the season, eh, who cares? Just let him get better so it's not nagging him all year. And Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, you take more precautions, I think, with Yager because of his age. He is 45. He's not as uh, durable as maybe some of our younger players are, so... If there's any sort of problem there, you've probably got to pull him off and put him on the IR. And as a guy who is older and is being paid a million bucks, I think we have to be able to have him out of the lineup for a week or so. Like, he's not probably a pivotal part of this team yet. No. And, like, he's already getting there in terms of scoring and all that. And, like, he's got two assists and is looking more like he did last year in Florida. But, you know, he got banged up, and he'll miss a week, and then he'll be back. So, we'll see. It gives other people an opportunity to try and rekindle things as well. So, with Yager out, that does probably put a hole on the top line on the right wing. Um, Matt, if you were coaching this team, would you end up putting Furlan back up there? Would you try somebody else when the team hits the ice against Nashville tomorrow? What would your first line look like? Hmm. I'd probably, all things being equal, I'd probably throw Kachuk on the first line. Just because, why not see? Uh, because all the other lines are kind of messed up right now. Uh, anyway. Uh, but I, I'm expecting either Furland or Lazar will probably slot back in. Versteeg might even make sense on the first line. We'll see. Uh I'd expect Furland to get the first crack at it, though. Glenn Gullitson is slow to change his line, so I can't see him breaking up the 3M line yet. I don't think Furland or Lazar, they both had a shot, and I don't think either one of them has looked great so far. So to me, I would try somebody else and put Versteeg up there. 
And if nothing else, then you make it a, you got to earn your way up there. We're going to try everybody out to see how they work, and whoever works best earns the first line. Yep. And that might be what this team needs as well, motivation leads to have some sort of incentive system. Yeah, yeah like even a guy like Sam Bennett might not be a bad idea because he's one of those players that he just needs a bounce to go his way, and I think that then his whole game will turn around. It's just, he's really fighting it right now, and it's, like, if it could go wrong for Bennett, it is. <laughs> well, we know that Bennett won't be moved to the first line tomorrow because the Flames have already announced what that line will be. They made what a lot of people were waiting for. They made the call. Do you remember in the 60s Batman, Matt, how they used to have that red phone they'd pick up whenever they needed Batman at the commissioner's office? What, I uh, picture something like they had that red phone it was like under a lid and they had to pick it up and then it would yeah. go directly to the bat cave yeah i picture something like that quickly we must summon mark jankowski and you pick up the phone and it just rings and janko's on the other end so janko's been recalled he's got seven points in four games so far in stockton and it's already been announced he will be centering what now looks like line three but could be line four with him in the middle uh sam bennett moves to the left wing and curtis lazar on the right wing that might be an interesting line pairing. I'm going to be curious to see how those guys look. And that might take some pressure off Sam Bennett, too, from playing center. Mm-hmm. Well, it, what my argument with Bennett has been is to keep him as a center until he plays himself out of it. And maybe just a little bit of playing on the wing might help him to like refocus his abilities. Who knows? We'll see. Like if Jan I'm expecting like if Jankowski plays well in his recall, that he will not go back down. So then you obviously have too many centers. So I think if that's the case, then Bennett would have to move over to the wing full time, which that doesn't hurt. It's just not the optimal way of doing things, but. It is what it is. Well, you could also move Janko over to the wing, too. I mean, Gulliton said today that he has never seen Jankowski play wing, but he's seen Bennett play wing, so he's more comfortable putting Bennett on the wing. But as he gets to know both guys, maybe you end up having, you know, Bennett and Jankowski swapping who's playing center and who's playing left. Yeah, well, plus, uh, realistically, you have to look at just the size of the player taking the draw and... A guy like Jankowski has a little bit more upper body strength and reach with his stick because of the height difference, so that does make a little bit of a difference. Plus, he's one of the top face-off guys in the AHL, so it, it's one of those where it you're getting an upgrade in the face-offs anyway from Jankowski to Bennett. The nice thing about that line, too, is with the refs enforcing the face-offs the way they seem to have been so far, is it gives you two guys who can take that face-off. If one of them gets the boot, you know the other guy's going to be there and ready to take it. Mm -hmm. And Lazar well, can play some center, too. Yeah. Well, that's where the NHL is going, where you have multiple centers on each line just for that specific reason. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily have multiple centers, but I think you'll have more wingers taking draws at practice and learning how to take draws. So even if they're not the best at it, they're capable of it. Yeah. Well, I'm meaning like former centers, not like current. You know what I mean? Like wingers who have played center before. So Jankowski will be. Not like a guy like Goudreau, who's, you know, obviously never. Yeah, been a guys center, who've so. never, never had any center experience. Just a little bit of a difference. Which, I don't know, it's tough. I mean, centers are always so sought after, and having multiples of them on every line, that's going to get tricky for a lot of teams. Even when I look at our roster, there's not a lot of guys that aren't playing center who have center experience. Yeah, well, Calgary just has the luxury of having too many good centers, period, anyway. So Definitely a luxury, and you know we're fortunate we have one line of it, but there's other guys on our team that, uh, that aren't at that point place and i think face being able to be a winger who can win a face off is going to be a different skill set in the next couple of years that is going to be sought after 
So Mark Jankowski will wear number 77 when he debuts with the Flames this season tomorrow against Nashville. And look for him, as we mentioned, with number 93 and number 20, and we'll see how that line looks. We've talked enough about the Calgary Flames. Why don't we look at some of the upcoming Flames in the system and some of the guys that maybe will, if this team doesn't turn around, get a call-up. Some of them, maybe not. Uh, the Stockton Heat are off to a good start this year. They've played six games, and so far they have a 4-2 and two record. So they're looking better in the parent club so far. The first line down there, surprisingly, Jankowski, Hathaway, and Mangiapani, which is not what I would have expected the first line to look like. And Mangiapani not only has the team lead in points after th- his first three games, but has also become the third Heat player to post assists in five straight games, joining Kobe Roback and Lyndon Vey. Matt, what are your thoughts on Mangiapane sneaking into the the uh, record well, book there? Well, it's good for him, and uh, it, he has a lot to prove, especially with the guys like Fu and Dubé and Phillips that are coming up through the organization. He has to show that he's ready to take those next steps and not just be another Kenny Agostino type where just a very skilled, shorter player that can't quite make it to the NHL. There's a name I didn't think I'd hear, name I didn't think I'd hear again. You know, I, I've been a fan of Maji Panis and we've seen him at the rookie camps and the rookie tournaments. I think he's got a dynamic play style, and I think he can do it, but you're right. He's not top, at least in my books, he's not top of the depth chart. So I think giving him first-line minutes is really a proving ground to see what he can do, and I think a Jankowski Hathaway Mangiapane pairing is a really interesting. Yeah, line. and it also all three of those players I think are the first call ups at each of their positions because all of the rest of the guys like Poirier, Klemtruck, Shinkarik, Fu, like they haven't looked very good overall, and Fu the least so. But it's like okay. You've got these guys here in the first line. You have to be better than them if you want a recall. And thus far, not a lot of uh, competition there (laughs) from any of the other Stockton forwards. And again, only, you know, six games in the season. Not Not a huge sample size to look at. But it looks like both teams might be taking a little bit of time to get going. But just for Stockton fans to know, Mangiapane sitting at 10 points right now, 3 goals, 7 assists. Garnet Hathaway is at 8 points with 5 goals, 3 assists. Jankowski has 5 goals, 3 assists, also 8 points. And then right after them is two defensemen. Uh, Oliver Shillington has 5 points with 4 assists and 1 goal. And Tyler Watherspoon as well, 4 assists and 1 goal. Rasmus Anderson has five points as well, five assists, no goals. And after that, it's pretty much insignificant. So names I was expecting to be at the top. I mean, Jankowski, I expect to be one of the top point getters. Shillington, didn't really expect w- Watherspoon to be in there, but he's one of the more veteran guys yeah, this you, year. You, if you're Anderson, over the age of 24, you should be one of the top guys on the team in points because otherwise, why are you there in the first place? We've asked that question about Watherspoon a few times. True, but at least he's backing it up a bit with actual on-ice results. Yeah, no, that's true. Another prospect that's worth talking about is Spencer Fu. Spencer Fu scored his first professional goal on Friday. It was a power play goal, and I've watched it a few times. It's nothing all that pretty, but it's just good to know that Fu's got that goal, and that's always a huge monkey off your back when you get your first professional goal. Yeah, and he, uh, along with the other guys that I mentioned earlier, have a long way to go to take that next step and become a full-time NHL player. Now, here's a question for you. Uh, The Flames have a couple of areas of weakness. Do you see the Flames, not necessarily right away, but over the course of the season, perhaps dealing from some of their prospect depth, guys like Shinkarik, Poirier, J- uh, Klimchuk, Fu, to get an upgrade in their NHL lineup. Right now, I'm not sure how much those prospects are worth on the open market. No, neither am I. But like, I'm saying like getting a legitimate number six 
say like at the trade deadline and using one of those guys do you see them going that route if you could trade kind of one for one maybe but i don't think you can and i don't want to see us shipping out a package of prospects to get a number six I think we can find the right number six internally. I mean, that was the plan going into the season, whether that's Raz, whether that's Kulak. I think we can find a, a number six internally, and we have to. I think if we trade away prospects for yet another veteran, it's sending the wrong message that we don't have any room for young guys. I think we need to wait and let one of those young guys try and take the job. Oh. Uh. You know, if, if we're missing a like a number two or number three defenseman, I could see maybe doing that. You know, we moved some of our veterans, or some of our veteran prospects like Kanzig and stuff like that over the summer for some upgrades. But I don't think when I look at it right now, I don't think we have any pieces that are really that valuable. You know, I don't know what Shin Carrick, I don't know what Klimchuk are going to get you on the open market unless you're just trying to recoup some draft picks. I agree. I just figured that... Yeah, I'd throw that one out at you. We'll see what comes at the deadline. I think I would be more likely to deal an NHL forward for a, a number six defenseman. Yeah. Now we've got enough NHL forwards. I think we could part with one. Now I got another question to throw at you. The Olympics are over, right? Do you sign Jerome Ginla if he wants to come here and all that? The Flames fan of me says yes. The Flames pundit in me says no. We've already got Yager. I think if we didn't have Yager, it might be a different scenario. But my first question is, well, who who gets sent off the team for Iggy? And who's going to be saddled with the two old guys? It's like, you know, sitting between your uncles so you don't cause trouble at Thanksgiving. <laughs> like... You know, who's going to be the... Is it going to be Bennett? And it could be a great thing to have, you know... But they're both right-wingers. So, who gets kicked off the team for Iggy? You can't put Iggy back on the first line. I think optically it doesn't work. I don't know. I don't... I don't think the team will do it just from a PR perspective. Uh. You know, I think they brought in Yager. There's a lot of fanfare about Yager. I don't think you then go out and also collect a Ginla. I could see again like coming in only the only way I can see it working is if he says he's done. If he says he wants to retire, you sign him even if you don't play the guy. You sign him, you put him in the last game of the season, he raises his stick and next season we raise number 12. Yeah. Yeah. But we I mean he's been eerily silent. Like Iggy's not usually a guy who doesn't talk and we haven't heard from him all summer. We don't know what his ideas are. From what I understand, he's living in Boston. He had some hip surgery over the summer, but we don't know how bad it is. We don't know. You can't go from not playing to being in the Olympics. So to me, he's got to play somewhere before that. You can't sit around doing nothing. I mean, we saw how that worked with Yager over three months. So I guess my thing with Iggy is something's going to happen here soon. It has to. And I'm wondering where he ends up playing. If it's North America, if it's a senior men's league, you just can't sit at home and, be ex- and expect to be ready for the Olympics. Uh, what do you think, Matt? Would you bring him back? If the dollars were right and the Flames still, like, if none of the prospects take one of the right wing spots, because I think that between Lazar and Furland thus far, it's been kind of, they've just been there. And it, the Flames still could use another right winger. And that's why I thought maybe that might make some sense. But I think but if we get all the way to the whether Olympics it's a and these guys or... are still playing the same way, then we have other problems. Yeah. Well, then, yeah, you're going to go out and acquire somebody along the way if those guys don't step up. I think to me, if those guys don't step up, you try somebody like a Poirier. If Poirier doesn't do it, then we've got bigger issues. If we have no right wingers in the system who are ready for the NHL, I don't know that. I mean, Iggy's going to be a short term fix, and I'm not sure at this point a short term fix is what we need. True. You know, you're not signing again to do a two, three, four year deal. Oh no, no, and you would just like you might use a get a rental and then just try to find somebody in the off season, but. You know, I just figure I'd throw that out at you and but see. But we've, we've already gone down that road. Yeah, well. 
Last time we went right winger shopping in the offseason, we, we landed Troy Brower. And now he's the third best forward on the team. So there like, you go. <laughs> six, eight yeah. games in. <laughs> but but what I'm trying to say, though, Matt, is I think if, if we're at the point where we the only option left to us is Jerome McGinley, something's gone wrong. Like somebody from the farm has to step up. We can't. I think if we're sitting here after the Olympics saying – the best possible option here is Jerome McGinley. Something has failed in our system this yeah. year. I agree. I think it'd be fun. Don't get me wrong. I think it'd be fun to see Iggy back here. But I think optically, too, there's... Optically, it's a it's a difficult PR balance to strike because we sort of moved on from the Iginla era. It's sort of like when Flurry left, right? We moved on to the next era. And if you bring them back... I don't know. It sends a it sends yeah. a weird message. I agree. But we'll see. That's a long. The Olympics are a long time yeah. from now. Gotta have something to talk about. Jeez. The last. <laughs> the last couple of prospects we want to talk about are guys not playing in the AHL who are playing more hockey than again Liz, even though they're not at the AHL and actually doing something. Uh, Tyler Parsons, the Flames goaltender, who everyone's high on we weren't sure where he was going to play this year he ended up turning pro but not playing in the ahl he's been reassigned to the kansas city mavericks of the echl and he has two wins and one loss in three games so far talking to some people who've seen those games they're saying that he's looking fantastic and that so doesn't far. surprise me uh, i would not be surprised if he gets an nhl game in this year just uh sort of like riddich and uh gillies at the end of the year last year and just to give him some incentive to for the off season and into next year. Do you think this is the end of the road now for Mason McDonald? No. Uh, goalies take a long, long, long time. Most of the time. And there's a reason why Mason went in the second round. The fundamentals are still there. He's just taking a long time to put it together you give him an extra handful of opportunities there's no rush it's not like the flames have another three or four goalies in the system that are coming up so if parsons moves up quickly mason will still be there and it, sometimes goalies don't figure things out until they're 25 26 so make or they're tim thomas until they're 40 well i think he was 35 when he return to the nhl but yeah uh, you know what i mean like it's it, there's no rush and we'll see the, uh, there's no incentive to cut bait like uh, you'd keep mason mcdonald around probably until he's 25 anyway just to see if he eventually turns it around which you know i think he's 21 now so plenty of time like goalies are uh, you can't <laughs> Uh, they're the one position where you kind of just throw the draft pick at a player and see how he does. And, you know, uh, a goalie can look spectacularly terrible in juniors and that and then be great as they move along. Uh, like Patrick Waugh, his goals against average when he was 18 in juniors was over six. <laughs> and then he comes into the NHL... And he wins the Stanley Cup, so... Or you go the opposite. I always remember... Do you remember the hitman goalie Alexander Fomachev looked fantastic in the dub and didn't do a dang thing in the yeah. NHL? It, goalies are so hard to predict. Like, I remember uh, reading about uh, Waugh when he came up where, like, the media in Montreal, because their two goalies both got hurt right before the playoffs, that, like, oh, season's over and all that because they have to rely on this kid who has an over six goals against average and yeah well <laughs> so you know like there's no the rush other thing to yeah. the other thing to remember here too is i think it's inevitable that we bring one of the farm goalies up to to the nhl next year we can't run with two we've just got so much goalie talent we can't run with two NHL goalies like Lack and Smith again. So I think it's going to be Gillies. And that changes the whole equation. I mean, right now we're just trying to find a place to put guys. But if, say, Gillies comes up next year, I think Parsons jumps to the A, 
And McDonald gets a starting spot in the ECHL back. Well, similarly, like, say Vegas loses one of their two remaining goaltenders right now, it's entirely possible that the Flames give lack to Vegas. So, because, of, like, Gillies has played well in Stockton, maybe you want to have him up in the NHL sooner than later. So, you know, it there's... A whole bunch, like especially if Gillies plays well for the first half of the season, I could see the Flames moving out Lack at some point, just to create room for the kid to get him some NHL reps in and move Parsons up. So we'll see. Uh, there's lots of different ways that things can go with the goalies. Are there any? I'm trying to figure, find the list here. Are there any free agent goalies for Vegas to sign? Or are they pretty much at the point where if they need NHL experience, they got to make a I deal? I think that they're at the bottom of the barrel now. Well, Anti Niemi's on waivers. As I said, they're at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> that's both. That's I, under I the. Vegas, that's under the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> when a guy has over know, seven if, goals against average, like you're, you're good. You know. You, you were just talking about Patrick Waugh. Yeah, well, that that's in the NHL now versus the 80s. So I don't know. I If I was Vegas, I might take a shot at Niemi before I'd make a deal. Yeah. I mean, if you don't want him, you can always return him to the team that you took him from, Pittsburgh. No. I don't think they want him back. But. Yeah, no, you can't. You're, you're stuck with – if you claim a guy on waivers, you're stuck with him. Well, can't you re-wave him? Yeah, but you're still stuck with him. Yeah, but I mean, he's probably not got a long contract. I don't think anyone's foolish enough to sign Niemi long term. Yeah. If nothing else, they send him to Chicago, wherever their AHL affiliate is, and he's better than Legacy, potentially. Yeah. Um, maybe they do. Maybe they do have to make a deal. You could be right. But I just don't – I think in the end I don't see, uh, like, a Smith-Lack pairing or bringing in somebody else like that. I think – Smith or Lack stays, whoever looks better, and the other one is moved out in favor of, let's just say, Gillies for the sake of mm -hmm. argument. And then everybody moves up. So for one year, it looks like we have a, a log jam in net, but it's all going to clear itself up by the end of oh, the yeah, year. Oh, yeah, for sure. Two other guys we wanted to point out in the Flames system, not playing pro, but two of our junior players. Matthew Phillips, who plays in the WHL for Victoria, is leading the WHL in points with 28 points in 13 games. And Adam Ruzhiska is 20 points in 13 games for the OHL Sarnia Sting. Maybe those are the guys the Flames need to find a way to bring up for their 10-game trials, and they can ignite the offense. Well, they unfortunately have to wait till the end of the season for that, unless there's a emergency situation like when they recalled Berchi that one time. Yager's hurt. It's an emergency. I don't know. He, he looked fine in his after-hours interview. I'm sure we could call other guys hurt, too. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, it's just good to see. I mean, we always like to see prospects that are doing well. And having two guys leading, you know, two of the three big Canadian leagues, the dub and the O, it's really good to see that, especially from guys that are lower down on the depth chart. We'll see what happens with Phillips. I think he's... I think he's going to be a small player. I don't know he gets the NHL look that he might if he was bigger, but I think Ruzhitska has some uh, some definite upside to him. Well, Ruzhitska, I was always confused why he was available in the fourth round. Like, it just didn't make a lot of sense because centers with size and any skill usually go early. So, a little baffled that he fell to the flames, but hey... I'll take it, you know, and hopefully he continues to have a good season and hopefully his year last year was just due to the fact that he came over to North America for the first time and didn't speak any English for a good portion of the year and hopefully that's behind him and now he can just be himself and tear up the league and hopefully push for an NHL spot in a couple of years. We spend so much time focusing on the NHL prospect, but it's, or the NHL product. But it's nice to see some of these young prospects as well. So if you're a if you're a fan, watch out for those guys. Phillips comes through here quite a bit to play the Hitmen. So if you want to see a Flames prospect, grab some tickets next time Victoria's in town. Well, Matt, we had a 
poll on the website last week. We asked, if you were the coach, what would you do with Sam Bennett? And we spent a lot of time talking about him last week. We got some interesting poll answers, but the winning answer from last week was it's only six games in the season. Let's wait a little while before we make a decision. The other two popular answers were he takes too many penalties, bench him, and try him on the left wing. So it looks like the Flames are finally going to try him on the left wing. But for the most part, nobody said it's time to trade him, it's time to get rid of him. Um, I think as Flames fans, and we talked about this, we we have different expectations because of where he's drafted, but we're all willing to be patient with this player. Oh, for sure. And it, them trying him out on the left wing for at least the Nashville game will hopefully help him snap out of his own circular frustrations it, it seems like he takes a bad penalty which gets his offensive game off and because the offensive game's off he takes dumb penalties and it just keeps going in that circle and hopefully just him doing something different might be enough to spark some change in him and if not maybe sit in the press box and eat popcorn for a game is what he needs to do and honestly if he say he's pointless after the Vancouver game in early November, then I think you do have to sit him for a game or two. Just to, like, get your head together and let's go. And unfortunately, he's struggling pretty mightily, and hopefully he can start doing some of the fundamentals correctly so that way he can start snapping out of the funk because once he gets going it's like last year at the end of the year he was really good in the last month and a half of the season it's just when he's playing well he looks fantastic and you can see what when he's not playing well he's just in the penalty box yeah exactly and he just needs to do the fundamentals take some lessons from brower and just focus on the fundamentals and getting doing the little things right and all the rest of it will come it's just he seems like well, he's this is where trying I think that to having him playing with a veteran like Yager could be a really good thing for him mentally. Yeah, well, I think he's just trying too hard to do too much and he's just putting too much pressure on himself and it just seems like he just is getting in his own way and sometimes you just need to do something different and like say playing on left wing just to snap out of the funk and hopefully that works for him or eating some popcorn. Yep. We'll see. Well, this week's question that we're posing to you guys, all of our listeners, is will Jankowski play well enough to stay in Calgary when Yager returns? Do you think he's destined to just go back to Stockton? Do you think he can play his way onto this team? Let us know. You can vote by going to firesidechat.ca, our website. We'll post the poll on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. Or we'll put it on Facebook. And on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash firesidechat. So let us know what you think. I know for many people, they've been waiting for the day that number 77 gets recalled. He's here. What What's going to happen with this? Is he going to get sent back down? Well, is he destined to play in Stockton? Or can he make the team? Let us know what you think. Yeah. Matt, what do you think? Oh, I think that he'll play well enough where he'll stick and force the move of somebody else. And I think uh, Hamilton will probably go in lieu of him. I won't make my Douglas joke. No. I don't know. I The Flames seem to like Hamilton at up here. I think that you might see them... Maybe they'll send him down just because he's going to be easy to send down. I don't think that's the final... The final piece to the puzzle is just send him down but I think it just gives him flexibility till they figure other things out yeah well we know that tomorrow night the Calgary Flames play the Nashville Predators in Nashville it's a 6 p.m. mountain start time and that will be the Mark Jankowski debut we've only seen 10 NHL minutes of him so far and we'll see if we see more from tomorrow in Nashville it is a back-to-back on the 25th the Flames also play the St. Louis Blues in St. Louis another 6 p.m. start time then on Friday the 27th, they come back to the Saddle Dome hosting the Dallas Stars. And on Sunday the 29th, the 7 p.m. start time, they have the Washington Capitals and Alex Ovechkin coming to visit. Matt, four games on the table. Do you think that we're going to have another week of no wins? I'm going to go with one win. Which one? Dallas. I don't think that they are playing right now in a way that they can actually 
contend with anybody who has their stuff together. And so you think I we're going to have our think... stuff together by Friday? Mm, no, I just don't think Dallas is very good. So Okay. Because w- the Flames, their, their wins have come against teams that either are mediocre in their own right or uh, they don't have, like... The one game that they played well against somebody who's actually decent was L.A., and even then they played poorly for, like, 35 minutes of it. (laughs) So, you know, Anaheim was largely injured for the win in the Honda Center. The Jets were terrible, and are terrible, and Vancouver is terrible. So, anytime the Flames have gone up against somebody that's semi-decent or good they've lost so you know uh don't see dallas being a very good team this year kind of a bubble-ish team uh, With but a... the other uh, but the other three are all top-notch teams and i just don't see the flames right now being good enough to even have any fight for, against those teams I think the nashville game may end up looking something like the ottawa game i think could be very one-sided in the other team's favor I'm expecting we see the season debut of Eddie, well, the starting debut of Eddie Lack in St. Louis. I think you've got to sit Mike Smith at some point, uh, and on a back-to-back on the road, why not? That'll be the interesting variables. What does Lack look like there? I think we might be able to squeak out a win against St. Louis, but the game I'm really worried about these this week is Nashville and Washington. I think Nashville could embarrass us, and Washington could embarrass us. I agree. So if they don't have four lines running properly, it's not going to be a fun week. No, and we know that Yager's not going to be back before Halloween by putting him on the IR. He's out for at least a week, which means, you know, we, we do have a week to see what we can do with Bennett and, and um, you know... Jankowski. Know. We do have a week to see what we can do with Bennett and Jankowski playing together and what other lineup changes might be made during that time. Like I said earlier, I think if we're not seeing what we want by Dallas, maybe you blow the thing up and try all brand new lines. Yep. Well, we will talk again around uh, Halloween, and hopefully things aren't as scary looking as they are now, and this team can turn it around. I think we've got to win two of these four games to stay in contention early on. Yeah, otherwise we're going to have a pretty much an identical repeat of last year, start of the year, and that's like the one thing that I think everybody from management down wanted to avoid. Let's hope they can do it, man. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week, and hopefully the Flames have a good one too. Let's hope they have as good a week as we probably will. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.